So good evening, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, new endocrinology and diabetes drugs. These are some novel drugs which have been recently approved by the FDA. Plus, I will be discussing some drugs which have shown promising data in the clinical trials and very likely to be soon approved by the FDA. This is a very hot and trending topic for the exams. Uh, recently, in the specialty exam, European board exam, there have come many uh, questions involving side effects and mechanism of action and monitoring parameters for the new drugs. And they have been also frequently asked in the DM and DNB endocrinology preparation exams. So we are going to talk about different drugs uh, which have been newly approved. We'll be talking about oscillotrostat, levoketoconazole, both of them which have been recently approved in the management of Cushing's. We'll be also talking about the clinical data supporting the use of selicilip. We'll also talk about tocilizumab and rituximab and their role in thyroid eye disease, and even about iskalimab and belimumab, all having a role in Graves and Graves eye disease. We'll talk about vandetinib and cabozantinib in the role of management of thyroid cancer. We'll also talk about the latest FDA-approved drug, teplizumab, which is uh, recently highlighted in the guidelines as well in terms of uh, prevention of progression of type 1 diabetes. We'll talk about the novel oral anti-diabetic agent, Imelgin. We'll talk about the drug use in diabetic nephropathy, which is finrenor. We'll talk about baricitinib, which is also one of the drugs studied in terms of preventing progression of the beta cell decline. We'll talk about natapara in, and its role in the management of hypoparathyroidism. We'll talk about the once weekly insulin icodec. We'll talk about the uh, pegylated uh, PTH, which is transcon PTH, and its role in the management of hypoparathyroidism. We'll also look at the uh, role of PTH 1 to 84, uh, which is again a new drug in the management of hypoparathyroidism. We'll talk about the Fizolinitin, which is a new drug recently approved by the FDA in the management of hot flushes in postmenopausal women. We'll also talk about Bempidoic acid, which is an LDL lowering drug. We'll talk about Inclisiran, which is a six monthly injection for LDL cholesterol lowering. And we'll talk about Ivanicumab, which is having its role in the management of familial hypercholesterolemia patients. So these are all the new endocrinology and diabetes drugs which we are going to discuss in my lecture number 71. So let's start right away. So talking about first about oscillotrostat, it is an FDA approved drug. It's recently approved for the management of Cushing's disease. It is an oral agent that has been approved for adults with Cushing's disease who are not candidates for pituitary surgery or who have undergone transplantal surgery but have persistent disease. What's the mechanism of action? Again, has been asked almost two or three times in the recent exams of SC as well as European board. So like metarepone, it blocks the 11 beta hydroxylase enzymes. And of course, by doing that, it will block the synthesis of both cortisol and aldosterone. So this is how it works, oscillotrostat, it reduces the cortisol by inhibiting the 11 beta hydroxylase to interrupt the last step of cortisol synthesis pathway. So very important to know the mechanism of action of this drug and its similarity to metarepone in terms of its action. What is the dosage? So initial dosage is two milligram twice daily. Then you have to titrate by one to two milligram twice daily, no frequently than every two weeks according to the rate of cortisol changes. And we should also take into consideration their tolerance and the clinical response. If the patient tolerates a dosage of 10 milligram twice daily, but cortisol target is not achieved, dosage may be increased by five milligram twice daily every two weeks. And the typical maintenance dose is somewhere between two to seven milligram twice daily with a maximum cap of 30 milligram twice daily. How to monitor uh, in terms of the response, the so cortisol levels initially from at least two 24-hour urinary free cortisol collections every one to two weeks until we achieve an adequate clinical response. 
and make sure that it is maintained. And then we can just do it at least every one to two months or as indicated. We should always use caution in interpreting urinary free cortisol levels in patients with moderate to severe renal impairment due to their reduced urinary free cortisol excretion. And in this case, consider using methods other than the urinary free cortisol for the cortisol monitoring. In terms of the electrolytes, serum, potassium, and magnesium should be monitored prior to initiation and periodically thereafter. We should have a baseline ECG and also after one week. Why? Because there can be QTC interval prolongation, which can happen. So that we need to take into consideration as well. We should monitor the blood pressure, look out for any signs of edema, look out for any signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, like feeling fatigue, anorexic, hypoglycemic, hypotensive, nausea, vomiting, weakness, or hyponatremic. And we should monitor more frequently, especially if the patient is having underlying hepatic impairment. Moving ahead, the second drug, which is levoketoconazole, again, recently FDA approved for the treatment of Cushing syndrome. It is comprised of the pure L-form enantiomer of ketoconazole. This inhibits adrenal steroidogenesis with two to four times the potency of ketoconazole. So it is approved by FDA for the treatment of endogenous hypercortisolemia in adult patients with Cushing syndrome when surgery is not an option or when it has been not found to be curative. So levoketoconazole is a cortisol synthesis inhibitor. In vitro, levoketoconazole inhibits key steps in the synthesis of cortisol and testosterone, principally those mediated by CYP11B1, 11-beta hydroxylase, CYP11A1, the cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme, which is also the first step in the conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone, and CYP17A1, which is 17-alpha hydroxylase. Again, this mechanism of action has been asked in the recent exams, extremely important for the exams as well as in clinical practice. Again, this is a diagrammatic representation of the same. As I mentioned, keep in mind CYP11A1, CYP17A1, and CYP11B1. So these are the three main targets uh, by which it works. So dosage is 150 milligram twice daily. Initially, this may titrate to 150 milligram per day no more frequently than every two to three weeks based on the cortisol levels and tolerance. Maximum of 1.2 gram per day in two equally divided doses. Monitoring parameters, cortisol levels initially obtain at least two 24-hour urinary free cortisol collections every two to three weeks, almost similar to the uh, previous drug which we looked at until adequate clinical response is maintained then every one to two months or as indicated. Again, watch out for the patients who are having a, a renal impairment. In these cases, use other methods. Monitor morning serum or plasma cortisol as needed during therapy and periodically assess for signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency. Liver enzymes at the baseline, ALT, AST, and bilirubin, and then weekly for at least six weeks, then every two weeks for the next six weeks, then monthly for the next three months, and then as uh, clinically indicated. ECG again at the baseline, and before we do any dose increase, and then routinely after a stable dose is at least. Again, do a serum potassium and magnesium prior to initiation and periodically thereafter. So how do we look in comparison with ketoconazole, levoketoconazole, even though there is no head-to-head -head comparison between the two, it offers an advantage over ketoconazole in terms of reduction of hepatic toxicity. Two agents, however, appear to have a similar efficacy when urinary free cortisol is elevated up to five-fold normal. Levoketonazole have a longer half-life and that allows for a twice daily administration. This is a potential advantage for patients who may be unable to adhere to six to eight hourly dosing, which we need to do with ketoconazole and metalopin. Moving forward, teplizumab, this is the first disease-modifying therapy in type 1 diabetes, recently FDA approved. It is a humanized anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody by which it uh, acts on the, uh, 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 I mean, it's an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody. It causes a delayed decline in the beta cell function. And uh, this specifically works in patients who have been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. We'll talk about what do I mean by this, about the stages in terms of the diabetes. So tecprozumab is approved for individuals aged eight years and older who have got stage two type one diabetes. What do I mean by stage two type one diabetes? There should be greater than or equal to two diabetes related autoantibodies and dysglycemia. We'll talk about this in the next slide. 
and of course teplizumab is administered as a single 14 day course of daily intravenous infusions so what do we refer to as the stages of type 1 diabetes stage 1 is two or more autoantibodies pre symptomatic and the patient is normoglycemic stage 2 is where teplizumab works and uh, that is what the study is regarding and it has been uh, proved to be effective in this group of patients who have got two or more autoantibodies, those who are pre-symptomatic or those who have got dysglycemia. What is dysglycemia? Those who have fasting glucose between 100 to 125, those who have a 2 hour PPBS of 140 to 199, and those who have an HbA1c between 5.7 to 6.4. So all of this we can refer to as even pre-diabetes. What about stage three? Patient is already symptomatic at this stage. Autoantibodies may even become absent at this stage. And patient has already got overt hypoglycemia, which will meet the ADA diagnostic criteria of diabetes. So virtually all individuals with stage 1 type 1 diabetes will progress to stage 3 type 1 diabetes, approximately 35% within 5 years and almost 70% within 10 years and almost more than 95% within 15 years, just to be aware of these uh, numbers. But most importantly, as I mentioned, useful in stage 2 type 1 diabetes. Again, this is a drug which is salicylip, uh, comes across sometimes in the exams. It is not yet FDA approved, again, in the management of Cushing's disease. Preclinical studies have shown that salicylip, which is r ros covitin suppresses the neoplastic corticotrop proliferation and pituitary ACTH production. In human cell cultures, it has shown to be selective cyclin-dependent kinase inhibition. It also inhibits cell proliferation. POMC transcription and ACTH production in neoplastic corticotropes. This may directly target pituitary corticotropes in Cushing disease and reverse hypocortisone. Potential reversal toxicity resolves with treatment withdrawal. Lowest affected dose requires further determination. Of course, data is still limited, and yes, it's still not FDA approved in the management of Cushing's disease. Let's move on to teprotumibab. This is an IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor, one receptor antagonist, again, frequently asked in the previous exams, this mechanism of action, it is a monoclonal antibody. It is FD approved in the management of thyroid eye disease. So looking at the rationale behind the use of these drugs and look at the role of TSH receptor antibodies, of course, we all know TSH receptor antibodies play an important role in the pathogenesis of thyroid eye disease by activating the orbital fibroblasts and the adipocytes. So TSH receptor antibodies are closely linked to the IGF-1 receptor and initiate an orbital inflammatory environment. That's why there is a significant crosstalk between TSH receptor antibodies and IGF-1 receptors in orbital fibroblasts, such that activation of TSH receptor antibodies by TSH receptor autoantibodies can lead to IGF-1 receptor signal transmission. And this causes a synergistic effect on GAG production. And this leads to activation of both the receptors. This crosstalk between TSH receptor and IGF-1 receptor forms the basic for the therapeutic use of teprotumumab, which is basically an IGF-1 uh, receptor antagonist. It's a monoclonal antibody, and it's used in the treatment of thyroid eye disease. So inhibition of the IGF-1 receptor ultimately results in the apoptosis of the orbital fibroblasts and adipocytes, and as such, a subsequent reduction in proptosis. And that's how it works. And a very important mechanism of action to remember for exam. So dosing in thyroid eye disease is 10 milligram per kg as a single dose IV, followed by 20 milligram per kg every three weeks for seven additional doses. No dosage requ adjustment required in kidney or liver impairment. Adverse events, we have nausea, we have muscle spasms, we have diarrhea, we have hearing impairment. Out of this, the hearing impairment is the most important for the exams. Uh, this has been frequently reported in teprotumumab group. Other adverse reactions can include alopecia, fatigue, dysgeusia, headache, and dry skin. And patients with type 2 diabetes may experience deterioration in the glycemic control. Again, a very important side effect to remember for the exams. The hearing impairment and deterioration of the glycemic control. So hearing impairment, especially as I can say, there has been uh, some literature around it with uh, teprotumab. Uh, it is uh, found that uh, almost uh, in review of the adverse events, 7 to 81 percent of the patients with thyroid eye disease reported hearing changes uh, after a mean of around four teprotumab infusions. 
So this was in the form of ear fullness, pressure, tinnitus, hearing loss. Audiograms were not routinely performed. In a subsequent observation study evaluating hearing outcomes, 21% of the patients had declined in hearing on audiometry immediately after completing therapy. So a decrease in hearing was more common in patients with a baseline hearing dysfunction. So patients with hearing loss had baseline hearing dysfunction. This is what was found out as well. And that's why it is important to discuss this potential adverse hearing effect prior to initiating therapy and obviously to have a baseline uh, hearing function evaluation before starting this therapy. And it is reasonable to obtain baseline audiometry in all patients and repeat it in individuals who report any changes in their hearing parameters. It is important to discuss potential adverse events prior to initiating therapy and review symptoms at each visit. Approach to monitoring for hyperglycemia, as I mentioned, it can cause deterioration of the glycemic control and hearing loss varies. It is reasonable to obtain baseline audiometry, do a baseline blood glucose measurement, uh, check if the patient has a history of prediabetes, and then go forward. So that's the end of my free view. Of course, uh, in my full lecture, I have discussed the other agents uh, which are the new and novel drugs in the treatment of uh, the endocrinology and diabetes patients. So if you like to get access to the full lecture, please subscribe to my lecture series and you can get in touch with me through my WhatsApp number as well as my email. Thank you so much.